Hello, my name is Martin Schulze. I work at the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics in Garching, close to Munich, Germany. And we work on attosecond spectroscopy. So we try to explore uh, ultra fast, uh, mostly electronic phenomena in matter uh, with the, the fastest spectroscopic tools that, that we can develop. Now, I, here I would say it's a one of the really high-end branches of, of laser technology. So we use a, a mode lock short pulse laser sources, really like the, the shortest optical signals that you can synthesize from a, from a, a solid state laser. So the, these laser pulses, they really comprise merely one, maybe a bit more than one oscillations of, of the electric field. And um, yeah, these, these signals are are impressive on their own. They are, they just, I mean, they contain all the, the spectrum of, of, in our case, all the spectrum of, of visible light. They really look, look white. Now people develop similar laser sources in the, in the infrared and you don't see them anymore, but they share the, the, the same uh, 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 cool feature that it's really the, the electric field of light, the function of time oscillating once and then it pulses over, right? So it's really, it is something very not CW in, in, in a laser sense. I think they are cool because any non-linearity, any non-linear process you want to think of, if you drive it with such a short laser pulse, it will become a, a very, very non-linear, right? It will on, effectively only happen once or twice within this laser pulse, depending now on how many half cycles the, the electric field has. And then people discovered, okay, a, 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 a very non-linear non-linearity that we can think of is this, this so-called high harmonic generation. So uh, where you can think if you have the laser electric field and it's very strong, so a, a very intense ultra short laser pulse, it would, if you illuminate an atom, suppress the, the Coulombic potential that binds electrons to the nucleus. And then if it suppresses that, an electron can escape, right? We call it tunnel ionization. So then you have a, an ionized a ion, ionized atom, and a free electron. And there's a strong electric field of the laser. So the, the laser will accelerate the electron. After a while, the laser uh, electric field re uh, reverts sign, the electron stops, it comes back, and then with some certain, uh, uh, unfortunately, not so big likelihood, the atom can catch this electron again. But then the electron had a lot of kinetic energy, right? And this has to go, and it goes as a XV photon. And, uh, you can think this tunnel ionization, this acceleration coming back, all this is, is, is uh, pretty nonlinear by nature. So the XV radiation that comes out is confined in time much better than the laser pulse was before. So what you have afterwards is still most of your laser pulse, because as I said, the process is not very efficient. You have still most of your laser pulse, and then you have a very short XV signal in time. And that's, a, that's the perfect pulse pair for pump probe spectroscopy, right? So you would always think of experiments where one pulse triggers an event and then a second pulse after a controlled uh, uh, time delay, the difference in arrival time at, at the sample of these two pulses, the second pulse probes what happened. Of course, in the beginning, the, the first data sync pulses were demonstrated in uh, 2001, 2002. Uh, in the beginning, of course, it was exciting just that it's possible, right? So then people know, okay, this is the for sure absolutely shortest signal uh, we ever uh, ever created, right? And this, this was just exciting by itself. The, the phenomena that led to, to the synthesis of these very short pulses were sort of understood. They were not, not a, a very spooky physics that people had to, to argue many years to understand what actually happens. It was just beautiful that it worked that way. But then it, it became more or less immediately clear that if you can do spectroscopy with these pulses, that you would be able to look at the entire set of phenomena in an entirely new way, right? To really look at, at dynamics of the electrons in, in matter, right? So, I mean, of course, quantum mechanics works well, but it is, in, in, at least from the standpoint of the electron, it's sort of a time integrated uh, theory, right? So everything happens, you describe everything in your level schemes, but there is never really, a, a, nobody ever asks the question, okay, how long does it take now to excite and go back and all this, right? Because mm, it's an easier way to think, but also the experimentalists never challenge this with, with the previous methods, right? But I, I think the applications are 
Look, it's still uh, in its infancy in a way, right? It's, let's say, 15, 14, 15 years old now. And one application, so after doing a lot of atomic physics in the past years, one of the, the fascinating applications we've, we believe we found is that now we can look at uh, electron dynamics in solids. So we did studies which are still uh, entirely basic science, but we, we did studies asking if you illuminate a semiconductor or, or insulator, if you want something with a, with a band gap, so let's say in the beginning all uh, electrons in the valence band, and then light comes to excite them into the conduction band, to turn the stuff conductive. So, yeah, one application we are following is to study this in real time, to really see how this transfer happens, then what the electrons do once they are excited, how relaxation processes take place, how the electro initial electronic excitation acts on the lattice, how we can make that as reversible a, a, as possible to, let's say, build a hyper-fast optical switch and stuff like that. Yeah. There is fast spectroscopy around, but all this fast spectroscopy is usually uh, bound to look at uh, more, be more time integrating with regard to the electron dynamics. So dynamics of the nuclei we can track with, with femtoseconds, but if you really want to know how the electrons, what they do at which time, we need this other second uh, time resolution. And that is what, what that we can do this with the other second pulses is, I think, what justifies the huge technological effort that these, these experiments mean. Yeah. For us, now that the, the spectroscopy as a methodology is mature enough that we can really look at solid state phenomena and so on, what is motivating for us is to, to come to bigger events like that where not only the other second people are, is to, to, under, to talk to people and to understand what are ultra fast electronic phenomena that they are interested in to understand, but weren't able to study uh, with their slower methods before. It shall not be ignored that the, the outcome of this is, of course, not in the next two, two or three years, right? But it's really, it is, uh, it is extending our understanding of, of nature in a, uh, and I have no doubt in the future, it, in a way that, uh, that will be technologically relevant, right? So I don't think that, that many of the, the, the technological breakthroughs of human history really came without anyone thinking about it on a more basic level before, right? So.